who are here in person and those of you who are logged on. Um, my name is Bradley Flam. I'm the director of the Office of Sustainability at Westchester University, and I am very happy uh, to welcome you to this, the uh, seventh presentation in our Spring 2022 Sustainability Research and Practice Seminar. We're proud to co-sponsor this series with our colleagues in the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs and the Sustainability Council Scholarly and Creative Activities Committee. Um, we have five more presentations after today. Uh, if you haven't seen the program, uh, they are uh, fascinating uh, topics uh, from uh, scholars and students and staff from all over campus. Um, and you can find that on the Office of Sustainability's uh, website. On the homepage, just scroll down to the bottom and you'll find a list of all the speakers and topics. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, just welcome you one more time and thank Professor Alex Cohen for agreeing to uh, share his research with us today. So let me hand the, the digital floor to you, Professor Cohen. <laughs> thank you so much, Brad. Uh, I am absolutely delighted to be here. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Again, my name is Alex Cohen, and I am a assistant professor in the uh, marketing department uh, in the Business College. And uh, I would like to welcome you to my presentation, especially any members uh, out there who might be on the uh, TEP committee. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so I am very pleased and proud to be joined today um, by uh, a dear friend and research colleague, I'd like to introduce to you um, Alexandra Luzier, who had graduated from uh, Westchester um, with a master's in um, public administration back in uh, May of uh, 2020. And she had worked with me um, on many of these research projects as well as uh, being my uh, graduate assistant. And now she is the Senior um, Director of Business Development and Communications for um, a company that's very, very close uh, and dear to my heart, Accessible Pharmacy Services. So I just wanted to give uh, Alexandra just a, a moment to say hello and just to, to speak about uh, Accessible uh, Pharmacy Services just for a minute. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having us and thank you, Alex, for having me here today with you. Um, I'm always honored to be with Alex and I'm honored to work with Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind. Um, just really quickly, we are a comprehensive home delivery pharmacy um, and we specialize completely in the needs of the blind, the deaf blind and the low vision community. Um, we're currently licensed and provide services in 34 states, including Washington DC, as well as Puerto Rico. Um, but we are growing every day we provide accessible packaging as well as accessible labeling solutions, um, depending on a patient's preference and need so that a patient can independently and safely manage their medications. Um, I'm saying all this because our company's mission and our services for our patients um, is based on Dr. Alex Cohen's years of research, uh, which found that there was a huge need for an accessible pharmaceutical marketplace uh, for the blind community. With that said, we are still actively continuing our research. Um, and if anybody is doing healthcare related research for you know, the disability community, uh, we would love to be a part of it um, and move our mission, mission forward. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, or if you would just simply like to learn more about us, go ahead and visit our website. It's just accessiblepharmacy.com um, or you know, we're also all over social media. So please don't hesitate to um, give us a call or reach out via email or website or you know, whatever is your preference. Um, but yeah, with that said, let's move on to the more exciting stuff, which is um, Alex's presentation and I will stop talking and let him get to it. Um, Alex, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alex. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yes, please go visit accessiblepharmacy.com. Now, um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, digital inclusion in the marketplace. Um, just to, to note a, a slight difference, um, there is a difference between uh, definitions, I guess, that are used for digital equity versus digital inclusion. Dig digital equity commonly refers to um, access to the internet, whereas digital inclusion 
is you have access, but uh, might not be able to uh, uh, participate or be uh, included, whether that be for accessibility really related reasons or otherwise. And that's where uh, my research really starts. I have uh, devoted uh, the past several years to researching um, the inclusion of uh, the disabled community in the marketplace, specifically looking at the blind and low vision community um, and uh, their inclusion in the digital marketplace. So um, uh, I guess, uh, Alex, we'll start with... Um, we'll like, start with online accessibility, the problem. All right, so the problem is that a website is either designed to be accessible or inaccessible. Just very, you know, similar to how a physical marketplace can be designed to be either accessible or inaccessible. Um, there are definitely um, uh, resources that are available to help companies make their website and organizations make their uh, websites more accessible. Um, if you just Google website accessibility resources, uh, you'll get um, maybe uh, 20 or 30 million hits uh, or 20 or 30 million options that uh, Google will give you. If you uh, say website accessibility you know, consulting, you might get 60 million hits. Anyway, there's um, uh, a sense out there where um, wonderful organizations like the World Wide Web Consortia have really developed uh, 48 different uh, conformance uh, issues that they've identified affecting website accessibility. And they categorize these different issues into uh, type A, type AA, and type AAA, um, either making things uh, you know, very difficult or impossible to you know, very difficult or just plain old difficult. Um, but the, when, when you're navigating the web, uh, if these issues, um, appear, uh, they really interact very badly with um, somebody who might have a, you know, a disability or, or needs uh, these accessibility related issues to be remedied. Um, so the same principles um, bound like universal design, right? Like um, a ramp uh, into a store or an automatic door helps lots of people, not just people with disabilities. Well, so does a, a well-designed um, website that are free from these accessibility issues. We're not gonna go into all of these, these issues. This is not um, a computer science lecture or web design or anything like that. Uh, I, am, I am a marketer and interested in consumer behavior and the feelings of, of, the, uh, of the population and their reactions to, to these service failures. So we're gonna move on from this, uh, but if you want more information about website accessibility uh, issues, I do uh, suggest that you visit webaim.org or uh, w3c.org. Um, all right, so now. Now we're on to online accessibility, who is impacted? Okay, so. Um, Roughly one in five or 20% of uh, the population has a, a disability that affects uh, a major life activity. Now of these individuals, maybe half of that or within the US population, you know, roughly 30 million Americans would be affected by uh, website accessibility. A website uh, accessibility really comes from the inability to use a point and click device like a mouse, um, whether that's from um, uh, a, a, a disability related to uh, cognitive or uh, mobility, cognitive like uh, cerebral palsy or, or mobility uh, based on certain types of uh, paralysis um, and of course uh, uh, vision impairment as well. Um, so the the use of screen reading technology, screen reading uh, software converts text to speech um, and it's designed to lay out and, and read uh, text and, and, and commands to uh, the user, but a website has to be designed in such a way to be uh, accessible with this technology, compatible with this technology, and also have the ability to be navigated without the use of a mouse and just uh, using keystrokes. 
blind and low vision? So um, although the problem of website accessibility um, affects more than just the, the uh, blind and low vision population, um, the most advocacy uh, is, uh, has been propelled by, by uh, blindness organizations. And over the past 20 years, there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of lawsuits alleging uh, discrimination against uh, businesses uh, who have inaccessible websites. Um, and again, most of these, <laughs> these lawsuits uh, are filed by uh, blind and low vision uh, customers. So um, also just from a research uh, standpoint, um, uh, working with uh, the uh, blind and, and low vision population, which you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proud member, um, is, uh, is, is a bit easier to get through the IRB than maybe some of uh, working directly with some uh, other uh, uh, disabled populations. Social identity theory. So um, we are looking at the experience of service failures and what occurs um, as a result of when a uh, blind user uh, or a blind potential customer is confronted with an inaccessible website. And so the theoretical development of, of our propositions start with social identity theory. So social identity theory is often uh, used to uh, explain uh, prejudice uh, and discrimination. Now, we are not alleging prejudice, uh, that a web uh, and an inaccessible website is you know, prejudicial or um, done with malice. We really do feel uh, it's more of an awareness issue than some type of uh, diabolical decision being made to exclude people with disabilities. Now that, you know, we'd, we'd like to think that that's not true. Um, but uh, looking at social identity theory uh, provides us that, look, this is, it's an in-group versus an out-group dynamic. Uh, so the blind and low vision are the outgroup in this case, because the in-group, uh, the sighted uh, and sighted developers, um, do not, could not directly experience um, the, the lived experience of being blind or what it's like to confront uh, an inaccessible website any more than you know, wearing a temporary blindfold exposes you to the lived experiences of, of, of being blind in some way. So, so this in-group, out-group dynamic uh, lends itself to uh, the basis for um, this being a discrimination event. Now, uh, in previous work that I've done um, that was uh, published in the uh, Journal of Consumer Affairs, did a five-year study to look at the accessibility of the websites for the top 100 uh, retailers in the U.S. Uh, according to the National Retail Federation. Found that you know, regardless of the type of retailer, whether it was a department store or a pharmacy, grocery store, sporting goods, whatever, um, they were, you know, showed a, a the evaluation showed that most of these uh, retailers were very um, inaccessible. Um, now, the, um, the population of the blind and, and low vision, um, it's a big population. I mean, in, in the US, it, it might be roughly 10 to 12 million people, but we know that this is also growing um, as a result of uh, age-related eye diseases. And, um, you know, there have not been uh, cures or, or much advancement in, in curing these age-related maladies. So people who have been used to, you know, the well-documented well aging of the baby boomers, um, people who have been used to uh, conducting transactions online for uh, the past 20 years or so, um, you know, these websites continue to be inaccessible. And as people lose their vision, they're going to find that um, these websites are, are going to remain inaccessible unless uh, a greater uh, awareness is, is provided in some way. So again, uh, social, identi so social identity theory uh, establishes for us the in-group, out-group uh, dynamic uh, of our work.
Disconfirmed expectations. So marketplace um, research that um, looks at satisfaction and dissatisfaction as um, is at the core of, of what we examine at, at, um, for service failures. It's all based on Festinger's you know, 1954 cognitive dissonance. But what we propose and what, what's been proposed in the past, what we're building from is that all marketplace experiences, all interactions um, come with a set of expectations. Um, there's an expectation in the marketplace. There's an expectation that you'll be able to find what you're looking for, uh, that the personnel will be uh, friendly and welcoming, um, that it won't be crowded, that it will be you know, well lit and clean, or you know, um, things won't change prices drastically, right? So, so we have these expectations. Now, uh, what this con uh, disconfirmed expectations really looks at is, within the marketplace experience, an assessment occurs where um, there could be a gap between uh, what was expected by the customer and what was perceived to have been received by the customer. Um, did that experience uh, or interaction uh, meet those expectations? And if it did not, if the gap exists, that's where dissatisfaction exists, the dissatisfactory event. And oftentimes the, um, the reaction to a dissatisfactory event is based on that gap. It can be based on the size of the gap or the egregiousness of that gap. Attribution theory. So um, it's not enough to identify that a gap exists between what was expected and what was received. Um, there has to be blame attribution. There has to be um, the blame, the anger. Somebody needs to be at fault for this. Um, uh, it's kind of the difference between anger and frustration. Um, uh, anger is where you know can be directed um, at something that is directly at fault for causing a negative experience, whereas frustration occurs more as a uh, result of nothing particular being at fault. For example, uh, an airplane being, a flight being canceled due to bad weather is a frustrating experience, but who are you angry at? Are you just shaking your fist at God? Uh, you know, it just, it doesn't make sense to be angry at the, um, at the airline, but if the airline uh, purposefully uh, overbooks the flight because it knows that it has, um, you know, always has some, um, uh, people who don't show up, then, you know, and you get bumped because the flight is oversold, then yes, that would be anger towards the, um, uh, anger towards the airline or towards, you know. So we also look at um, Kelly's, um, part as part of attribution of, um, theory, we look at Kelly's uh, covariation, um, looking from 1967, and three uh, separate this, uh, three separate items need to be uh, present for this this attribution to occur. The first is um, uh, distinctiveness, which means that you know something occurred that um, can can be blamed. Something is at the center. Something is uh, at 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 fault for this. Um, the second is consensus, which is um, if other people had this same experience, um, you know, would they feel the same way? And the third is, is there consistency over time? Is there the possibility that this could, you know, happen again uh, on multiple uh, occasions? Now, when we look at website accessibility, uh, the, the, this really checks all of these boxes because a retailer is responsible for um, their website. Um, so that checks the uh, distinctiveness box. Consensus. Um, well, uh, we know that blind people um, have to use uh, screen reading technology to use their uh, computers uh, and to navigate the web. 
uh, some type of assistive technology. So if the website isn't designed to work with this assistive technology, this uh, particular failure is going to be um, uh, shared throughout the entire community. Also consistency. Um, it's not that easy to uh, fix a, um, uh, an inaccessible website. And so something might you know, be uh, inaccessible over time um, upon uh, repeated visitation, because um, just uh, one thing we also uncovered in uh, um, uh, our research of, of looking at website accessibility is that it costs roughly 1% more to design uh, and create a website that is accessible from the start, uh, from, from its uh, initial design and architecture. Um, it costs exponentially more to go back and retrofit a website for, um, for accessibility purposes and remedy these issues. Consumer normalcy. So, what is being disconfirmed in the expectation of a blind consumer? Now, uh, I've done a lot of work in consumer normalcy and actually looking at um, hopefully very soon um, a publication dedicated to creating a scale based on consumer normalcy uh, that we've been working on for a few years now. But so what is what expectation is being uh, disconfirmed? Well, so consumer normalcy is um, a concept that was first developed by uh, Stacy Baker in uh, 2006 in the Journal of uh, Retailing. Um, it's really, uh, and, and this was based on uh, interviews and dialogues with blind consumers. And um, to shop is to be human. Everybody is a, a consumer in some way or another. To shop is normal to somehow present barriers or block people's access from uh, shopping is uh, interfering with uh, their attempts to, to live their normal lives. So we uh, coined consumer normalcy. And consumer normalcy is derived by uh, four distinct items. Uh, the first is the ability to participate in the marketplace. I am here, I am participating. Um, to demonstrate competency and control in the marketplace. I am in control of what I do in the marketplace and the decisions that I make. Um, achieving distinction in the marketplace. I am me, I am free to be me and I am expected here. Um, and then finally to be perceived as an equal in the marketplace. I am an equal, I belong. Um, and so this, this, although the consumer never forgets they're, that they are blind. Um, the disability is ever present. Um, this uh, notion of consumer normalcy somewhat operates un, under the radar, uh, on, on a deeper level, not necessarily unconscious, but it doesn't get activated until there is a negative interaction with the marketplace and someone's disability that uh, disconfirms this, um, uh, this, this notion, disconfirms this expectation of normalcy, being able to participate, um, to be in control, to uh, achieve distinction and, and to be an equal. Welcome. So the next concept is welcome. Uh, and this was, uh, this concept was for, first derived in a piece that, uh, uh, appeared in, in 2007 by Baker, um, Holland, and Scarborough. Um, I think it was the, the Journal of uh, Service Marketing. Um, and uh, the researchers did the same thing. They, they, they interviewed uh, consumers with disabilities uh, about their marketplace experiences. Now, this was in the physical marketplace, but um, we feel that the concept can, uh, can be generalized to the online marketplace as well. And they discovered um, the, the concept of welcome, um, feeling wanted and welcome in the marketplace. And so uh, welcome um, is provided by positive interactions uh, with the physical marketplace, um, with uh, the personnel um, and uh, the, the, the personnel of the store, 
um, other consumers, other shoppers in the store and the, um, the selection of uh, products or services that are available in the store. Um, now, just like uh, consumer normalcy, um, whenever there is a negative interaction between any of these four items um, and someone's disability, uh, a dissatis you know, there's that expectation of not being, you know, there's the expectation of being wanted and welcome that they, they want me and expect me as a customer. Um, I can be included in this. Um, but if there's a negative interaction between any of these factors, um, then again, that, that disconfirmed expectation exists, that gap exists and a dissatisfactory uh, event occurs leading to anti-firm uh, behaviors, which we'll get into next. Okay, so now you have your hypotheses. Uh, starting with um, negative word of mouth or social media sharing? Okay, so we had uh, hypothesized that uh, an accessibility related service failure will lead to um, uh, negative word of mouth and uh, social media sharing. Now, negative word of mouth is uh, among the most common um, uh, reactions to a service failure. Um, and we know uh, from, from work done since the 60s, that negative word of mouth uh, lasts longer, um, resonates more with people as a more memorable and interesting event than a positive service failure. So therefore it, it tends to be shared more. Um, now, the way we looked at social media, um, we were very careful about this because social media, we specifically were looking at social media as a communication platform. And we also had to keep in mind the accessibility of social media platforms. Um, most commonly, the blind and low vision uh, community interacts with, um, uh, with Facebook and with Twitter, which are much more accessible than many other platforms. Uh, at the time this research was being conducted and, and we were collecting data, uh, Clubhouse was um, a bit too new in the marketplace to, uh, to add uh, to, to this. So we really were just looking at Facebook and, and, and Twitter. Um, so we wanted to see, uh, and, and we, uh, you know, based on previous literature, we, um, we hypothesize that uh, these service failures will lead to A, negative word of mouth and B, uh, social media sharing. Your second hypothesis is an avoidance of other sales channels. Okay, so in the uh, previous work that I mentioned from the uh, Journal of Consumer Affairs, we, we tested out um, uh, general avoidance propositions. Um, in this particular paper, we wanted to look at, well, what is the effect of an, an inaccessible website on a seller's other channel? So for the most part, um, many retailers aren't just operating with a, um, uh, on, with a website. They also have physical stores. Some might still have catalogs. They have access to uh, toll-free numbers. There are other ways for people to uh, shop and conduct transactions um, than simply on the website. Now, what we wanted to look at was um, the effect an inaccessible website has on a multi-channel system, even when those other uh, sales channels might be accessible, like a 1-800 line or uh, a Braille catalog or going to the physical store. Um, so it's uh, instead of looking at uh, a halo effect where um, you look at uh, does a positive interaction in one transaction channel lead to positive attitudes towards the seller's other channels, we're looking at a horns effect to look at how a negative service failure uh, might create uh, negative attitudes towards the seller's other channels. Hypothesis three is complaint behaviors in a direct third party. Okay, so we know that most um, uh, service, fail service failures occur all the time. And the literature shows that um, uh, 
service failures, mo most of the time retailers, shop, shop owners will never hear the complaint. They will never uh, receive a, a direct complaint from, from an angry uh, consumer more often than not. Uh, third party complaining is complaining to um, uh, consumer advocacy groups or attorneys or the press. Um, and although there have been thousands and thousands of lawsuits alleging discrimination for website and accessibility, um, the literature shows that, you know, uh, so, so we hypothesize based on the existing literature that uh, following a um, accessibility related service failure, people uh, will not complain directly to the retailer um, and they will not engage in third party complaining. Number four is an effect mediated by anger towards the retailer. Okay, so this is where the attribution theory comes in. Um, we wanted to, uh, ba based on uh, the, the retailer being responsible for their uh, design of their website, um, we wanted to uh, gauge the, the, emotional, uh, the emotional experience. Um, and so when in the event that um, an inaccessible website made, uh, created um, anger towards the retailer, um, did this anger then uh, mediate and make the uh, effects of negative word of mouth and social media sharing and um, avoidance of the other channels, did this make, um, uh, uh, create a, a higher or a stronger uh, likelihood of, of um, these behaviors. Number five is consequences stronger in high effort conditions. So we did a, um, I'm gonna get into the methodology, uh, but we had two, two separate um, uh, scenarios. One was a low effort scenario where um, the blind uh, user was unable to get past the homepage due to the inaccessibility of the homepage. And we gave a second scenario, a high effort scenario based on um, the um, user, the blind uh, uh, customer, being able to fill up their shopping cart and spend a significant amount of time doing so and shopping, but then being able to being unable to conduct the final transaction because um, the transaction process wasn't accessible. So the previous literature has showed that um, uh, when a customer uh, exerts higher effort in the shopping experience um, and is more emotionally invested. Uh, as, amount, uh, as a matter of this, this effort, um, that the uh, disconfirmed expectation phenomenon, uh, examination of that gap will be even, uh, even harsher and more severe. Number six is feelings of discrimination lead to higher levels of consequences. I also wanna let you know it's 12.35. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll rush to this. So we, um, <laughs> We, we wanted to see if feelings that a, an inaccessible website were uh, discriminatory toward the blind and low vision uh, community, if this feeling, if this opinion uh, moderated uh, the, um, the uh, subsequent uh, service failures effects and made them stronger. Methodology. All right, so we uh, used an electronic snowball sampling technique uh, and solicited uh, participants from the National Federation of the Blind, American Council for the Blind, American Foundation of the Blind, and, and uh, My Blind Spot had uh, 500, I think 520 uh, people participate, but after um, manipulation checks and attention checks, uh, we had uh, 380 uh, fully uh, completed um, uh, legitimate uh, completed surveys. Uh, we used a within subjects design. Uh, so everybody uh, was asked the, um, were, were first presented with the low effort scenario um, and answered the questions based on that scenario. And then uh, were presented with the high effort scenario and then answered uh, questions based on that scenario. Results starting with hypothesis one, which is negative word of mouth. 
Okay, so uh, an accessibility related service failure uh, did lead to uh, negative, both negative word of mouth and social media sharing. So this was supported. Hypothesis two was avoidance. So uh, yes, um, the, uh, um, the other sales channels uh, were avoided even if, even in the instances when they were accessible based on this um, uh, inaccessible website service failure. So supporting hypothesis two. Hypothesis three, complaint behaviors. Okay, so counter to what we thought, we thought people were not going to uh, complain uh, directly to the retailer. And it turns out <clears throat> from our group of participants that they did. Uh, so that part of the hypothesis was not supported. However, they did not engage or would not engage in third party uh, complaining. So that part of the hypothesis was, was supported. Hypothesis for anger. So anger did uh, mediate the uh, reaction and uh, those respondents uh, with higher levels of anger uh, also had higher levels of um, uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, reactions to service failures. Hypothesis five, effort. Effort. So this hypothesis was not supported um, the high effort condition uh, did not lead to more severe um, reactions to the service failure. Now it's important to note <clears throat> that they were both high. <laughs> like they, they led to these service failures, these negative word of mouth, this uh, avoidance and social media sharing. It just wasn't higher. There was not a significant difference between uh, high effort and low effort in this condition. And the last hypothesis, discrimination. And yes, uh, those participants who uh, uh, felt that um, uh, a uh, ex inaccessible website was discriminatory um, did uh, have um, higher levels of anger and, and uh, reactions to those service failures um, than, than people who did not, or those respondents who did not feel it was a discriminatory event. Limitations and future research. So limitations are uh, a respondent pool was uh, primarily um, uh, members of blindness advocacy groups who are very well aware of uh, accessibility related issues. It's very important to them. It's what the many of these organizations fight and lobby uh, for legislation for. So it's possible that this sample was a, a little more ardent than um, a, a non-affiliated sample might be. Um, also, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the next one I, I missed? Other disabled populations. Okay, we, we only looked at the blind and low vision uh, population, but uh, the problem does affect uh, a wider uh, array of, uh, of uh, consumers than that scenario approach. And using the scenario approach maybe wasn't great. It, it probably would have been better for us not to use a within subjects design uh, and give each um, uh, respondent just one scenario. Uh, also, it might be better to put uh, people in front of a, a computer and, and give them uh, an actual experience as opposed to um, a scenario-based approach social media e-commerce investigations are needed? So um, we just looked at social media um, as a uh, communication platform, but social media has really uh, arisen in the past few years as a transaction platform. And also m-commerce needs to be investigated as well um, in the, uh, access, the accessibility of, of different m-commerce functionality. Um, also other variables can be explored uh, such as um, uh, loyalty and, and time and commitment. And conclusion. So this is a widespread problem. problem. Uh, the affected feel that this is um, a, discriminant, uh, a discriminatory event, and it does affect a, a large number uh, of population. Um, 
So things that we can do to create uh, greater awareness, um, I think the lawsuits are going to persist, particularly as the uh, pandemic has put such a, um, a special focus on online commerce and accessibility. Um, the things that you know, we can do as a university com community is add more accessibility related modules to our curriculum. Um, whether that's in you know, computer science or education or you know, uh, the business programs that we offer, the more accessibility uh, modules and information and awareness that we can provide to our students, um, they'll bring with them <clears throat> into practice and uh, hopefully by doing this, we'll then promote a, a more inclusive uh, marketplace for everybody. I know that was a lot. Uh, I know we probably still have some time for uh, some, some questions, hopefully, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you could hear that applause. I, it took me a moment to unmute. Um, but there's an appreciative audience here at 255A site. Um, I know I have a question, but I want to give folks in the audience a chance first, if anyone would like to uh, kick it off. I just, um, are you emphasizing marketplace solutions in this situation or, um, or government regulation? Well, it's more like marketplace solutions. Um, because uh, the, 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 the specific uh, negative consequences we're looking at are negative consequences for the firm, for the retailer. Um, there are people, where, I mean, the, these groups are working uh, for, for years to try and get ADA Title III uh, to include uh, commercial websites. And the, the law is complicated. Um, there haven't been uh, adoption of uh, specific um, accessibility guidelines, and there's a lot of confusion in the legislation. Um, what we feel, as, a, as opposed to making it more policy-oriented, um, hit the retailer in the pocketbook and affect their revenue, and maybe, just maybe, that will uh, spur some 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 uh, uh, positive uh, results. Uh, I'll jump in now. Um, uh, I found this uh, presentation fascinating. The the work you did, the um, uh, methodologies you adopted, and the conclusions. And I have to admit, I was thinking often in your presentation about the Office of Sustainability's website. And I have to admit, we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about accessibility. And I just wonder, are the conclusions you came to applicable beyond uh, commercial websites? Could, for example, a, a website like ours, which is designed to educate and to inspire visitors to become involved in the work that we do, could we be um, uh, uh, unintentionally um, inspiring some of these negative uh, reactions uh, with the way our website is designed? Well, it, it, it's very possible that this could be generalized. Now, uh, Westchester though is not, um, not necessarily a, a retailer. There are some different, you know, there are di different laws governing uh, what Westchester needs to do to make its, its content of, um, accessible to students. I will tell you one project that is, uh, we finished and is currently under review is a four-year study of um, the accessibility of university uh, sport, uh, sport program websites and how there could be different legislative issues between uh, Title II and Title III because there are commercial elements to um, a university's athletic site. You might notice it's a .com instead of a .edu. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are definitely areas of uh, exploration, but whenever a website is inaccessible, um, it does, you know, it will create this 
the satisfactory event. But I don't, I don't, it would be interesting to test to see if people would then somehow become less engaged in sustainability initiatives on campus uh, because of that. that that's a, I think that's worthwhile exploration. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, are there any questions from our digital audience? Sarah, Amy? I was well, very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> you were. I, I, I would like to... Oh, go ahead, Amy. No, I was just saying, indeed, you were very thorough. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Professor Cohen, thank you very much for sharing this research with us. Um, uh, another excellent contribution to the research and practice seminar. Um, we're grateful for um, uh, both you and for Alexandra. Uh, for making time uh, to, to speak with us today. And um, I'd like to ask us to do one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and it's our pleasure and it's, it's always fun to, to, to share and hopefully uh, you walk away from this experience with just a little added uh, thought about uh, digital inclusion. Thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Thank you for Bye. having us. Bye.